Well, greetings, boys and girls and other gendered creatures. It seems the uh, syndicate of the Hoffman Associates or whatever the fuck they call themselves at AMB, and however it's really structured above them, I really don't know. I can only guess. Um, they're definitely being financed, and they're definitely mounting a huge campaign to incite violence against me, defame me and incite violence against me. There are stickers being put up all over the world that apparently connect to a video if you shine your um, phone at it that uh, was clipped out of a video that I made listing all the things that I'm being falsely accused of saying something that, uh, and I, I won't say it because they're just going to rip it out again. But let me say this real clearly. If you believe I'm a sexual predator, that's I guess I'm not. If you would like a, uh, <laughs> and they're going to rip that out. That you're going you're gonna, to, you're gonna, you're gonna get a, you're going to get a video that's, a, that, that's got just those words. Be aware, folks. Know, know the difference between a clip, propaganda, and reality. And if you didn't see me say it or see me post it, it wasn't real. You've been, you've been lied to. Um, at this point, they, you know, they've got these stickers going, on, going up all over the world. I mean, this is really a terrific effort. I mean, I wonder why... You know, they, they keep telling me what a useless piece of shit I am and, you know, how, how, you know, but why are you going to such effort to, to interdict my web presence, boys, to, to try and get me killed? You are really, literally trying to get me killed. Why? Why am I so dangerous? I know why. It's these blue eyes and that pretty smile. That sure ain't fucking dying from COPD. I have, I have an open... Uh, port of entry here. So this is like overtaxed and always like congested right through here. So there's a lot of mucus moving and my sinuses are always congested. That's where the cough is. My lungs are good. I mean, I couldn't play the horn like I do if my lungs weren't good. And I suppose I should. Because um, because really, this is a namaste motherfucker kind of video. You guys are doing something extremely illegal. And I'm nowhere near as impotent as you think. I'm just facing a lot of blockades because of the nature of Internet crime and the total lack of enforcement for anything down at this trivial level. I mean, there's, you know, like multi-million dollar shit going on that they can just barely keep up with. And, and terrorism uh, that, you know, where there's a lot more threat to public life and safety than some fucking idiot threatening to come to a poor old hippie artist studio and beat him bloody. And I'm not a transsexual. I'm not a homosexual man. I'm an intersex woman. And if you don't want to buy into that, I don't care. Because I've got acceptance in my community. I mean, like, real acceptance. These people are not, like, you know, just indulging me because they're afraid I'm going to go ballistic on them. These are people that accept me as Tommy and you're a girl. You're a woman with a penis and you're weird, but that's the way it is. And, and people like myself and my friends are an unbelievable threat to the status quo that's being painted. I mean, you people are congenitally stupid. You've been stupidified through 1,500 years of fear conditioning into believing things that just aren't true. I mean, let's start with the George Orwell. I, I should read a lot of that. I, I usually ought to read the, read the quote. I should pull up the whole thing about political language. Right, this, this, this fits so well, because that's what they're doing to me, is they're dehumanizing me for political goals. Um, and and, and they, they think I'm demented. Well, I don't know what they really think. You know, I mean, it's just so much gaslighting. There's, there's nothing I can say that's, that, that, that will be accepted as true. Um, you know, they've got me. I mean, yeah, my family's terrified of me. 
uh, of what been made me into years ago is what they're terrified. Uh, um, and I just, you know, I, I was able to get through to my father. Um, but I don't know about my brother's trying. My sister refuses. Um, I can communicate with my brother-in-law to an extent, as long as it's strictly business. Um, you know, they're all just, you know, everybody's in denial uh, of their own, their own misconceptions. So, and, and, and it's from political language. You've been, you've been like spoon fed all this, you're raised on lies. Um, this is, uh, an essay, I think he wrote. I'm not sure how long it is. Let's see how long it is before I get into it. It's called, um, it's called Politics in the English Language. It's copyrighted in the United States. Oh, I see what he's, oh, they, they'd want to sell it to me in the U.S. This is a freebie from the Orwell Foundation. And let's see how long it is. It is longer than I want to read. <laughs> it looks like it is. No, it's not too bad. No, I think I'm going to read that. Because that's what's going on here. Um, I'm, I'm a trans, I'm, 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 I come from a, a <laughs> I'm born into an ancient clan of, 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 of Israelite priests and scribes, okay? And I was raised by a really, educated by a really fine rabbi, a really great educator and a, a, a powerful orator, and just a beautiful man, Louis Binstock, um, who taught me a lot that's like really, like grown in me all my life. Um, and I've had good teachers all my life. Really good teachers, Bob Harger. He's really coming in handy lately, dealing with irrational idiots. You know how how do you just like, hey man, um, what you're saying there is like not real. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, this is you know that's a fallacy. You 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 you're you're, you're giving a fallacious argument. Um, and and you know my these people. You know, to ridicule the my, my musicianship and they have no idea what's going on inside my head where I'm working on ideas and understandings that were transmitted to me by Terry Moan and uh, uh, Jamie Hulick. I had a private lesson with Jamie Hulick, who was the premier tenor saxophonist, classical saxophonist. He used to write everything, everything that was written for tenor saxophone in those last quarter of the last century. I think he's still at it. Uh, I know he's still giving seminars. Um, you know, I'm a brilliant artist. I, 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 my output's poor. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm a terrible slacker, and, but because I've been alone, mainly, for a long time, um, since 1999, I haven't been able to find anybody trustworthy and uh, enough to last more than 30 days here with me. And I, I really, what I do requires a couple, two, it really requires four to six hands at least um, for optimal performance. <laughs> There's only one of us. Um, I'm a slacker when I'm alone. <laughs> It, keeps, it helps keep me young, you know. I'm, I'm going to be 67 years old. And, and real soon, I hope, uh, I, I'm trying to get this played out. I have to get this plate out. Before, uh, I just have to get the plate out. Now, my jaw has not deteriorated. I do not have cancer. Um, I was warned by a specialist that I just saw that there's a high potential for cancer that the idiots have translated into Tommy has cancer. Um, and it's, it's from that open, uh, open port of entry into my, into my, uh, circulatory system. That's causing the problem. Plus my allergies. But I'm going to be 67 in a couple of weeks and like, excuse me, my, my father's father was dead for 11 years. 
by the time he was 67. I think my mother's father was dead for a year or two by the time he was 67. And and my grandmothers were both uh, much more aged than this at 67. So I'm feeling good about my physical being. I, I, I really do need to uh, quit smoking, and I really am working on reducing my intake of that um, by increasing my intake of weed. <laughs> I'm one idiot thinking I'm a heroin addict and that I shoot it in my toes. <laughs> <coughs> I've never had a needle in me. And uh, the first time I was in an involuntary uh, uh, hospitalization, um, the guy who tried to put the needle in me got his hand broken. So we're going to read Politics in the English Language by George Orwell. Most people who bother with the matter at all would admit that the English language is in a bad way. But it is generally assumed that we cannot, by conscious action, do anything about it. Our civilization is decadent, and our language, so the argument runs, must inevitably share in the general collapse. It follows that any struggle against the abuse of language is a sentimental archaism, like preferring candles to electric light or handsome cabs to airplanes. Underneath this lies the half-conscious belief that language is a natural growth and not an instrument which we shape for our own purpose, says. Now, it is clear that the decline of a language must ultimately have political and economic causes. It is not due simply to the bad influence of this or that individual writer, but an effect can become a cause, reinforcing the original cause and producing the same effect in an intensified form, and so on indefinitely, like Trumpism, or prosperity gospel. A man may take to drink because he feels himself to be a failure, and then fail all the more completely because he drinks. It is rather the same thing that is happening to the English language. It becomes ugly and inaccurate because our thoughts are foolish, but the slovenliness of our language makes it easier for us to have foolish thoughts. The point is that the process is reversible. <laughs> Tell that to all those fucking anime addicted idiots. <laughs> Modern English, especially written English, is full of bad habits which spread by imitation and which can be avoided if one is willing to take the necessary trouble. If one gets rid of these habits, one can think more clearly, and to think clearly is a necessary first step toward political regeneration, so that the fight against bad English is not frivolous and is not the exclusive concern of professional writers. Some of us amateurs are concerned about it too. I will come back to this presently, and I hope that by the time the meaning of what I have said here will have become clearer. Meanwhile, here are five specimens of the English language as it is now habitually written. These five passages have not been picked out because they are especially bad. I could have quoted far worse if I had chosen, but because they illustrate various of the mental vices from which we now suffer. They are a little below the average, but are fairly representative examples. I number them so that I can refer back to them when necessary. So here's uh, Professor Harold Lasky in Essay in Freedom of Expression saying, I am not indeed sure whether it is not true to say that the Milton who once seemed not unlike a 17th century Shelley, had not become out of an experience ever more bitter and each year more alien to the founder of that Jesuit set which nothing could induce him to tolerate. Okay. And here's Professor Lancelot Hogman in Interglossia. Above all, we cannot play ducks and drakes with a native battery of idioms which prescribes egregious collocations of vocables as the basic put up with for tolerate or put at a loss for bewilder. Okay? Professor, uh, and, and here's Essay on Psychology and Politics in, from New York. On the one side, we have the free personality. By definition, it is not neurotic, but for it has neither conflict nor dream. Its desires, such as they are, are transparent, for they are just what institutional approval keeps in the forefront of consciousness. Another institutional pattern 
would alter their number and intensity. There is little in them that is natural, irreducible, or culturally dangerous. But on the other side, the social bond itself is nothing but the mutual reflection of these self-secure integrities. Recall the definition of love. Is not this the very picture of a small academic? Where is there a place in the hall of mirrors for either personality or fraternity? Um, so we go on from a communist pamphlet, number four, as all the best people from the gentlemen's clubs and all the frantic fascist captains united in common hatred of socialism and bestial horror at the high, rising tide of the mass revolutionary movement have turned on to acts of provocation, to foul incendiarism, to medieval legends and poison wells, to legalize their own destruction of proletarian organizations and rouse, again, rouse the agitated petty bourgeoisie to chauvinistic fervor on behalf of the fight against the revolutionary way out of the crisis. Okay. And a letter in the Tribune says, If a new spirit is to be infused into this old country, there is one thorny and contentious reform which must be tackled, and that is the humanization and galvanization of the BBC. Timidity here will bespeak canker and atrophy of the soul. The heart of Britain may be sound and of strong beat. For instance, uh, but the British lion's roar at present is like that of bottom in Shakespeare's A Midsummer's Night Dream, as gentle as any sucking dove. A Bureau, New Britain, cannot continue indefinitely to be traduced in the eyes, or rather ears, of the world by the effete langers of Langham Place, brazenly masquerading as standard English. When the voice of Britain is heard at nine o'clock, better far and infinitely less ludicrous to hear H's honestly drop than the present priggish, inflated, inhibited, schoolmarmish, arts braying of blameless, bashing, mewling maidens and I don't even want to try and speak no British like that. Each of these passages has faults of its own, but quite apart from the avoidable ugliness, two qualities are common to all of them. The first is staleness of imagery. The other is lack of precision. The writer either has a meaning and cannot express it or he inadvertently says something else, or he is almost indifferent as to whether his words mean anything or not. This mixture of vagueness and sheer incompetence is the most marked characteristic of modern English prose, and especially any kind of political writing. As soon as certain topics are raised, the concrete melts into the abstract, and no one seems to be able to think of terms of speech that are not happening. Prose consists less and less of words chosen for the sake of their meaning, and more and more of phrases tacked together like the sections of prefabricated hen house. I list below with notes and examples various of the tricks by which, by means of which the work of prosic construction is habitually dodged. Dying metaphors. A newly invented metaphor is just thought by evoking a visual image. While on the other hand, a metaphor which is technically dead, e.g. iron resolution, Yeah, these schools, you know, I, I have really good um, medical care. Um, I, I need to, like, be a lot more diligent about 
making good food rather than eating um, fattening food that's easy to prepare. Uh, and I need to quit smoking. But otherwise, I, my life is, and my health, my mental health, my physical health are all good. I, I, you know, I've been mostly alone all my life. I understand that I'm difficult to, to live with. And uh, people appreciate my art and don't really want to get into my life. I never have. And that's cool. I have, there are people that do. So, and there are a lot more people that respect me than hate me. I mean, I, I definitely appreciate my readers for that. I have almost 600 friends at, at Facebook, and at least 100 of them interact with me regularly. And I can see that a lot of others are, are, are definitely reading and watching my videos. It's just they don't react because it's too dangerous. They know that I'm being stalked, and, and, and some of them have already been targeted. Um, so back to dying metaphors. But in between these two classes, oh, okay. On the other hand, the metaphor, which is technically dead, has an effect reverted to being an ordinary word and can generally be used without loss of vivi vividness. But in between these two classes, there's a huge jump of, a dump of worn-out metaphors which have lost all evocative power and are merely used because they save people the trouble of inventing phrases for themselves. Examples are... <laughs> the, the, these aren't real good American examples, uh, and, and certainly not current. You have to remember, this is like from the 1930s, um, <laughs> or 40s, I, I don't know when he wrote this. When was this? Does it say? No. Uh, <laughs> these, these are some of the dead metaphors from back then. Ring the changes on, take up the cudgels for, tow the line, we're still using, ride roughshod over, they're still using, stand shoulder to shoulder with, still using, Play into the hands of, still using. No axe to grind, still using. Chris to the mill, still using. Fishing in troubled waters on the order of the day. Achilles healed, swan song, and hotbed. Um, many of these are used without knowledge of their meaning, like what is a rip, for instance. Um, and incomp incompatible metaphors are, 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 are frequently mixed. A sure sign that the writer is not interested in what he's saying. Some metaphors now current have been twisted out of their original meaning without those who use them even being aware of the fact. For example, toe the line is sometimes written as T-O-W the line instead of T-O-E the line. Uh, another example is the hammer and amble. Amble now always used with the implication that the amble gets the worst of it. In real life, it is always the amble that breaks the hammer, never the other way about. A writer who stopped to think what he was saying would avoid perverting the original phrase. Operators are verbal false limbs. These save the trouble of picking out appropriate verbs and nouns, and at the same time pad each sentence with extra syllables, which gives it an appearance of symmetry. Characteristic phrases are render inoperative, militate against, prove unacceptable, make contact with, be subject to, give rise to, give grounds for, have the effect of, play a leading part role in, make a self felt, take effect, exhibit a tendency to, serve the purpose of, etc., etc. The keynote is the elimination of simple verbs. Instead of being a single word, such as break, stop, spoil, man, kill, a verb becomes a phrase made up of a noun or adjective tacked on to some general purpose verb, such as prove, serve, form, play, render. In addition, the passive voice is wherever possible used in preference to the active, and noun constructions are used instead of gerunds. By example, instead of by examining, well, by examination instead of by examining. Um, I found myself doing, you know, catching that in my writing a lot, um, and changing it to the active voice. It, it gives it gives the 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 sentence a lot more drive than than the the passive voice. You know, by doing rather than did. <laughs> Done by doing is doing. The range of verbs is further cut down by means of the I's and I Z E and D E formations, and final statements are given an appearance of profundity by means of the not un 
uh, formation, simple conjunctions and prepositions are replaced by such phrases as with respect to, having regard to, the fact that by dint of, in view of, in the interest of, and the, uh, on a, the hypothesis that, and the ends of sentences are saved from anticlimax by such resounding commonplace as greatly to be desired, cannot be left out of account. A development to be expected in the near future, deserving of serious consideration, brought to a satisfactory conclusion, and so on and so forth. Pretentious diction. Words like phenomenon, element, individual as a noun, objective, categorical, effective, virtual, basic, primary, promote, constitute, exhibit, exploit, and utilize, eliminate, liquidate, are used to dress up simple statements and give an air of scientific impartiality to biased judgments. Adjectives like epic-making, epic, historic, unforgettable, triumphant, age-old, inevitable, inexorable, inexorable, Veritable are used to dignify the sordid processes of international politics, while writing that aims at glorifying war usually takes on an archaic color, its characteristic words being realm, throne, chariot, mailed fist, trident, sword, shield, buckler, banner, jackboot, and clarion. Foreign words and expressions such as cul-de-sac, ancient regime, douze messina, mutatis mutandis, status quo, Gleichschaltung, Weltanschauung, are, uh, my German is really bad and my, my Latin isn't very good either, um, are used to give an air of culture and elegance. Except for the useful abbreviations IE, EG, and ETC, there is really no need for any of the hundreds of foreign phrases now current in English. Bad writers, and especially scientific, political, and sociological writers, are nearly always haunted by the notion that Latin or Greek words are grander than Saxon ones. And unnecessary words like expedite, ameliorate, predict, extraneous, deracinated, clandestine, subaqueous, subaqueous, and hundreds of others constantly gain ground from their Anglo Saxon opposite numbers. The jargon peculiar to Marxist writing hyena, hangman, cannibal, petty bourgeois, loose gentry, lackey, flunky, mad dog, white guard, etc., consists largely of words translated from Russian, German, or French. <coughs> But, the normal way of coining a new word is to use a Latin or Greek word root with the appropriate affix. And where necessary, the I to E formation. It is often easier to make up words of this kind, deregionalized, impermissible, extramaritable, marital, non-fragmentary, and so forth, than to think up the English words that will cover one's meaning. The result, in general, is an increase in slovenliness and vagueness. Meaningless words. In certain kinds of writing, particularly in art criticism and literary criticism, it is normal to come across long passages which are normally, which are almost completely lacking in meaning. Words like romantic, plastic, values, human dead, sentimental, natural, vitality, as used in art criticism, are strictly meaningless in the sense that they do not only do and they not only do not point to any discoverable object, but are hardly even expected to do so by the reader. When one critic writes, the outstanding features of Mr. X's work is its living quality, while another writes, the immediately striking thing about Mr. X's work is its peculiar deadness. The reader accepts this as a simple difference of opinion. If words like black and white were involved, instead of jargon words being dead and living, he would see at once that the language was being used in a proper way. Many political words are similarly used, abused. The word fascism has now no meaning except insofar as it signifies something not desirable. This is not true. Fascism very like, strictly is defined as uh, a corporate governance. The, the industry takes over the, the, the government is what fascism is. It's used to meaning was about, and that's where the word came from, and that's what Trump tried to do. The words democracy, socialism, freedom, patriotic, realistic, justice have each of them several different meanings which cannot be reconciled with one another. In the case of a word like democracy, not only is there no agreed definition, but the attempt to make one is resisted from all sides. It's almost universally felt that when we call a country democratic, we are praising it. Consequently, the defenders of every kind of regime claim that it's a democracy and fear that they might have to stop using that word if it were tied down to any one meaning. 
words of this kind are consciously are often used in a consciously dishonest way, especially when describing the United States government. I'll get to that when we finish. Um, that is, the person who uses them has his own private definition, but allows his hearer to think he means something quite different. Uh, statements like, Marshal Patain was a true patriot, the Soviet press is the freest in the world, the Catholic Church is opposed to persecution, are almost always made with the intent to deceive, <laughs> especially with the Catholic Church. Nobody's been, like, charged with anything yet with the boarding schools, and some of that stuff is, like, you know... There's no statute of limitation on murder. And I would imagine that the institutions where these children were murdered, if there's nobody, I don't know how they, they I doubt if they can prosecute descendants of the people who did that. But these institutions are still in business. Some of the schools are still in business. Other words used in variable meanings in most cases, more or less dishonestly, are class, totalitarian, science, progressive, reactionary, bourgeois, and equality. Now that I've had made this catalog of swindles and perversions, let me give another example of the kind of writing that they lead to. This time, it must be of a, its nature of it be an imaginary one. I'm going to translate a passage of good English into modern English of the worst sort. Here's a well-known verse from Ecclesiastes. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. And in modern English, his objective considerations of contemporary phenomena compels the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably take, be taken into account. This is a parody, but not a very gross one. Exhibit 3 above, for instance, contains several passages of the same kind of English. It will be seen that I have not made a full translation. The beginning and ending of the sentence follow the original fairly closely, but in the middle of concrete illustrations, race, battle, bread, dissolve into the big phrase, success or failure in competitive activities. This had to be so, because no modern writer of the kind I'm discussing, no one capable of using phrases like objective considerations of contemporary phenomena, would ever tabulate his thoughts in that precise and detailed way. The whole tendency of modern prose, prose is away from concreteness. Now analyze these two sentences a little more closely. The first contains 49 words, but only 60 syllables. And all its words are those of everyday life. The second contains 38 words of 90 syllables, 18 of its words are from Latin roots, and one from Greek. The first sentence contains six vivid images and only one phrase, time and chance, that could be called vague. The second contains not a single fresh or resting phrase, and in spite of its 90 syllables, it gives only a shortened version of the meaning contained in the first. Yet, without a doubt, it is the second kind of sentence that is gaining ground in modern English. I do not want to exaggerate. This kind of writing is not yet universal and outcrops of simplicity will occur here and there in the worst written page. Still, if you and I were told to write a few lines on the uncertainty of human fortunes, we should probably come much clearer to my imaginary sentence than to the one from Ecclesiastes. Now, you have to remember, this guy was writing 80 years ago. And we've had, I don't know which side of World War II he was writing on. It could have been on, on this side. It could have been anywhere between 1938 and 1947. I think is when he did main, his main writing. Um, but it was that long ago. And I personally think that uh, at least American English has gone back to a lot, you know, especially in journalism, the language is much simpler and, and shorter, you know, shorter sound bites. People don't have the attention span, so they're trying to. You know they're, they're peppering you with 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 catchy catchy sentences, and, you know, you have gripping headlines, fear conditioning. You know, oh, new bad news! As I've tried to show, modern writing at its worst does not consist in picking out words for the sake of their meaning and inventing images in order to make the meaning clearer. It consists in gumming together long strips of words which have already been set in order by someone else. 
and making the results presentable by sheer humbug. The attraction of this way of writing is that it's easier. It's easier, even quicker, once you've had the habit to say, in my opinion, it's not an unjustifiable assumption, other than to say, I think. If you use ready-made phrases, you not only don't have to hunt about for the words, you also don't have to bother with the rhythms of your sentences, since these phrases are generally arranged as to be more or less euphonious. When you're composing in a hurry, when you're dictating to a stenographer, for instance, or making a public speech, it's natural to fall into a potential pretentious Latinized style. Tags like a consideration which we should do well to bear in mind, or a conclusion to which all of us should readily assent, will save many a sentence from coming down with a boom. By using stale metaphors, similes, and idioms, you have saved much mental effort at the cost of leaving your meaning vague, not only for your reader, but for yourself. This is the significance of mixed metaphors. The sole aim of a metaphor is to call up a visual image. When these images clash, such as the fascist octopus has swung its swan song, the jackboot is thrown into the melting pot, it can be taken as certain that the writer is not seeing a mental image of the objects he's naming. In other words, he's not really thinking, well, maybe he's trying to come up with song lyrics. <laughs> And put a melody to that. Look again at the examples I gave at the beginning of this essay. I mean, you know, that looks like a Woody. That's like a Woody Woody Guthrie song. <laughs> One of these is superfluous, making nonsense. Oh, here we're look again at the examples I gave at the beginning of this essay. Professor Lasky uses five negatives in fifty-three words. I noticed that right away. I was like, okay. Um, you know, because, like, you're trying to keep track of the negatives, you know, because, like, you know, you got it, it, you, more than one negative in a sentence or in a paragraph is like, all right, we got, to, we got to make sure there's no double negatives there. One of these is superfluous, making nonsense of the whole passage. In addition, there's a slip alien for a kin, making further nonsense. Yeah, I kind of felt that was off. Um, and several avoidable pieces of clumsiness which increase the general vagueness. Professor Hogman plays ducks and drakes with a battery which is able to write prescriptions while disapproving the phrase, everyday phrase, put up with, and is unwilling to look egregious up in the dictionary and see what it means. If one takes an uncharitable attitude toward it, it's simply meaningless. Probably one could work out its intended meaning by reading the whole truth of the article in which it occurs. In the writer, in four, the writer knows more or less what he wants to say, but an accumulation of stale phrases chokes him like tea leaves blocking a sink. In five, words and meanings have almost parted company. People who write in this manner usually have general and emotional meaning. They dislike one thing and want to express solidarity with another, but they're not interested in the detail of what they're saying. A scrupulous writer, in every sentence he writes, will ask himself at least four questions. What am I trying to say? What words will express it? What image or idiom will make it clear? Is this image fresh enough to have an effect? And he would probably ask himself two more. Could I put it more shortly? Yes. Um, have I said anything that is avoidably ugly? I, yeah, I, I asked myself these questions. <coughs> and uh, could I put it more shortly? I, I should uh, give a shout out to the, the little white book or whatever they call it these days, the Strunken, Strunken White um, elements of style. We'll uh, give you a lot of tips on how to streamline your, your, your sentence structures. Had I said anything, but you are not obliged to go to all this trouble. You can shirk it by simply throwing your mind open and letting the ready-made phrase come crowding in. They will construct your sentences for you. Even think your thoughts for you to a certain extent, and at need, they will perform the important service of partially concealing your meaning, even from yourself. It is at this point that a special connection between politics and the debasement of language becomes clear. I wonder what he's going to get to the quote. There's a famous quote that came, I think it came from here. We'll find out. <laughs> In our time, it is broadly true that political writing is bad writing. Where it is not true, it will generally be found that the writer is some kind of rebel, expressing his private opinions and not a party line. Like Gideon Levy, who writes for Haaretz. And 
It doesn't pull any punches on the Zionist government at all. Um, I'm trying to think of somebody else. I don't want to call her out for her hyperbole, so I won't. <laughs> uh, and move on. <laughs> I, I can get pretty hyperbolic, too. So, um, I mean, you know, 50 years of talking about climate collapse, and now I'm looking at it. You know, it's like, okay, well, now it's happening. You know, we've been warning that it's going to happen. Now it's starting to happen. So, please, take your denial elsewhere. Orthodoxy of whatever color seems to demand a lifeless, imitative style. And it gets real redundant. The political dialects to be found in pamphlets, leading articles, manifestos, white papers, and the speeches of undersecretaries do, of course, vary from party to party, but they are all alike in that one never finds in them a fresh, vivid, homemade turn of speech. When one watches some tired hack on the platform, mechanically repeating the familiar phrases, bestial atrocities, iron heel, bloodstained tyranny, free peoples of the world, stand shoulder to shoulder, one often has a curious feeling that one is not watching a live human being, but some kind of dummy. They sure went with, for it with they, they, they were sure eating it up from Donnie, and they still do to a degree, but I think he's losing it. Like, why has he not been indicted for anything yet? That's the question. A feeling which suddenly becomes stronger at moments when the light catches the speaker's spectacles and turns them into blank discs which seem to have no eyes behind them. This is not altogether fanciful. A speaker who uses that kind of phraseology uh, has gone some distance toward turning himself into a machine. The appropriate noises are coming out of his larynx, but his brain is not involved as it would be if, as it would be if he were choosing the words, his words for himself. If the speech he is making is one that he is accustomed to make over and over again, he may be almost unconscious of what he's saying. Ronnie Reagan had this one speech to fucking down, boy. <laughs> He, he had it totally down. <laughs> the one speech he was real famous for. Real short one. As one is when one utters the responses in church. This reduced state of consciousness, if not indispensable, is at any rate favorable to political conformity. Are we getting near the end? Yeah. Another couple of pages. In our time, political speech and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible. In things like the continuance of British rule in India, the Russian purges and deportations, the dropping of the atom bombs on Japan, apartheid in South Africa, apartheid in Palestine, and I added those in, can indeed be defended, but only by arguments which are too brutal for most people to face, and which do not square with the professed aims of political parties. Thus, political language has to consist largely of euphemism, question-begging, and sheer cloudy vagueness. Defenseless villages are bombarded from the air, the inhabitants driven out into the countryside, the cattle machine gunned, the huts set on fire with incendiary bullets, and this is called pacification. Millions of peasants are robbed of their farms and sent trudging along the roads with no more than they can carry. This is called a transfer of population or rectification of frontiers. People are imprisoned for years without uh, trial or shot in the back of the neck or sent to die of scurvy in Arctic lumber camps. This is called elimination of unreliable elements. It's also called extrajudicial, extrajudicial execution. And uh, the imprisoned for years without trial is now known as the administrative detention. Um... Such phraseology is needed if one wants to name things without calling up mental pictures of them. Consider, for instance, some comfortable English professor defending Russian totalitarianism. You cannot say outright, I believe in killing off your opponents when you can get good results by doing so. Probably, therefore, he will say something like this. While freely conceding that the Soviet regime exhibits certain features which the humanitarian may be inclined to deplore, 
we must, I think, agree that a certain curtailment of the rights of political opposition is an unavoidable com concomitant of transitional period. God, Brits are such dry beasts. <coughs> <coughs> concomitant of transitional periods and the rigors which the Russian people have been called upon to undergo have been amply justified in the sphere of concrete achievement. <coughs> you get the breathing dust. <coughs> there we go. Hmm. Uh, dust gets hung in here. Uh, where were we? The inflated style itself is a kind of euphemism. A mass of Latin words falls upon the facts that like facts like soft snow, blurring the outlines and covering up all the details. The great enemy of clear language is insincerity. When there is a gap between one's real and one's declared aims, one turns it as it were instinctively to long words and exhausted idioms, like a cuttlefish spurting out ink. In our age, there's no such thing as keeping out of politics. All issues are political issues, and politics itself is a mass of lies, evasion, folly, hatred, and schizophrenia. When the general atmosphere is bad, language must suffer. I should expect to find, this is a guess, which I have not sufficient knowledge to verify, that the German, Russian, and Italian languages have all deteriorated in the last 10 or 15 years as a result of dictatorship. But if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. A bad usage can spread by tradition and imitation, even among people who should and do know better. <coughs> The deep-based language that I've been discussing is in some ways very convenient. Phrases like a not unjustifiable assumption leaves much to be desired, would serve no good purpose, a consideration which we should do well to bear in mind, are a continuous temptation, a packet of aspirins, always at one's elbow. Look back through this essay, and for certain you will find that I have again and again committed the very faults I'm protesting against. By this morning's post, I have received a pamphlet with con dealing with conditions in Germany. The author tells me that he felt impelled to write it. I open it at random and there's almost the first sentence that I see. The Allies have an opportunity not only of achieving a radical transformation of Germany's social and political structure in such a way as to avoid a nationalistic reaction in Germany itself, but at the same time of laying the foundations of a cooperative and unified Europe. You see, you see he feels impelled to write, he feels presumably that he has something new to say. Yet his words, like cavalry horses answering the bugle, group themselves automatically into the familiar dreary pattern. This invasion of one's mind by ready-made phrases, lay the foundations, achieve a radical transformation, can only be prevented if one is constantly on guard against them, and every such phrase anesthetizes a portion of the brain. I said earlier that the decadence of our language is probably curable. Those who deny this would argue, if they are produce an argument at all, that language merely reflects existing social conditions, and that we cannot influence its development by any direct tinkering with words and constructions. Well, people seem to do that quite a bit, like things they call me, you know, tell a lie enough times that people will believe it. So far as the general tone or spirit of the language goes, this may be true, but it is not true in detail. Silly words and expressions have often disappeared, not through any evolutionary process, but owing to the constant, conscious action of a minority. Two recent examples were explore every avenue and leave no stone unturned, which were killed by the jeers of a few journalists. There is a long list of fly-blown metaphors which could similarly be got rid of if enough people would interest themselves in the job. And it should also be possible to laugh the not unformation out 
of existence. To reduce the amount of Latin and Greek in the average sentence to drive out foreign phrases and stray scientific words. And in general, to make pretentious unfashionable. Good luck with that. But all these are minor points. The offense of the English language implies more than this, and perhaps it is best to start by saying that it, what it does not imply. Okay, here we go. We're getting into the nitty-gritty now. To begin with, it has nothing to do with archaism, with the salvaging of obsolete words in terms of speech, or with the setting up of a standard English which must never be departed from. On the contrary, it is especially concerned with the scrapping of every word or idiom which has outworn its usefulness. It has nothing to do with correct grammar and syntax, which are of no importance so long as one makes one's meaning clear, or with the avoidance of Americanisms, <laughs> or with having what is called a good prose style. On the other hand, it is not concerned with fake simplicity and the attempt to make written English colloquial. Nor does it even imply, in every case, preferring the Saxon word to the Latin one, though it does imply using the fewest and shortest words that will cover one's meaning. What is above all is needed is to let the meaning choose the word and not the other way around. In prose, the worst thing one can do with words is to surrender to them. When you think of a concrete object, you think wordlessly, and then if you want to describe the thing you've been visualizing, you probably hunt about till you find the exact words that seem to fit in. When you think of something abstract, you are more inclined to word, use words from the start, and unless you make a conscious effort to prevent it, the existing dialogue will come running in, dialect will come rushing in and do the job for you at the expense of blurring or even changing your meaning. Probably it's better to put off using words as long as possible and get one's meaning as clear as one can through pictures and sensations. Afterward, one can choose, not simply accept, the phrases that will best cover the meaning and then switch around and decide what impression one's words are likely to make on the other person, on another person. This last effort of the mind cuts out all stale or mixed images, all prefabricated phrases, needless repetitions, and humbug and vagueness generally. But one can often be in doubt about the effect of a word or phrase and one needs rules that one can rely on when instinct fails. I think the following rules will cover most cases. Never use a metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech which you're used to seeing in print. Never use a long word where a short word will do. If it's possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. Never use a passive where you can use the active. Never use a foreign phrase, scientific word, or a jargon word if you can think of an every everyday English equivalent. Break any of these rules sooner than any... Break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous. Right. These rules sound elementary, and so they are. And, and, and you'll find a lot of word, you know, these, these rules are all shrunk and that's stuff from shrunk and white all the way. Um, you'll find a lot more in, in uh, elements of style. These rules sound elementary, and so they are, but they demand a deep, rate, deep change of attitude in anyone who's grown used to writing in the style now fashionable. <laughs> one could keep all of them and still write bad English, but one could not write that kind of stuff that I quoted in those five specimens at the beginning of this article. I have not here been considering the literary use of language, but merely language as an instrument for expressing and not for concealing or preventing the thought. Stuart Chase and others have come to near to claiming that all abstract words are meaningless and have used this as a year for protest, pretext for advocating a kind of political quietism. Since you don't know what fascism is, how can you struggle against fascism? One need not swallow such absurdities as this, but one ought to recognize that the present political chaos is connected. This is pre war, obviously. Uh, is connected with the decay of language, and that one can probably bring about some improvement by starting at the verbal end. If you simplify your English, um, I guess it didn't come from here. How about that? Oh, here it is. There it is. It is in his concluding paragraph. Uh, one need not swallow such absurdities as this, but one ought to recognize that the present political chaos is connected with the decay of language 
and that one can probably bring about some improvement by starting at the verbal end. And if you simplify your English, you are freed from the worst follies of orthodoxy. You cannot speak any of the necessary dialects, and when you make a stupid remark, its stupidity will be obvious, even to yourself. Now listen carefully, I'm going to repeat this twice. <laughs> political language, and with variations, this is true of all political parties, from conservatives to anarchists. Political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind. <coughs> and I'm going to point out that he's got one too many ands in this sentence. <laughs> There shouldn't be an and between per it should say here I'm gonna read it I'm gonna read it again properly parsed according to the rules he laid out himself. Political language, and with variations, this is true of all political parties, from conservative to anarchist, is designed to make lies sound truthful, murder respectable, and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind. One cannot change this all in a moment, but one can at least change one's own habits. And from time to time, one can even, if one jeers loudly enough, send some worn out and useless phrase like some jackboot, Achilles heel, hotbed, melting pot, acid test, variable inferno, or other lump of verbal refuse into the dustbin where it belongs, and make up new verbal refuse. Perpetual war machine. Junk heap on the Potomac. I like that. I'm like, man, nobody, nobody even comments on that when I say it. This is what, it goes right through them. A junk heap on the Potomac, they call the ship of state. That's my metaphor. <laughs> or simile, whatever it is. Um, I guess that's a metaphor. I don't know. It's been 60 years since I <laughs> had any, any, any official English. Um... So anyway, I think, let's see how long this has been so far. Oh, we're not even to an hour yet. So I think what I'm going to do is, like, bring up Happy Jack and, uh, you know, give him some credit for turning me on to that in the first place and turning me on to the phrase Happy Day, which I've got a lot of people saying. Um, and... Since I read that, this is even shorter. This is something else that Happy Jack was very much into. Um, you know, I, 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 my first gathering was in, in 1989. And I had uh, 1969 Dodge Motorhome. One and a half ton. And like the last God knows how many miles into that gathering was unpaved road. And then the last couple of miles was like big boulders in the middle of it. And about a half mile out, quarter mile out from the gate, I encountered um, Tai Chi Bob of Love and Ovens, with, who had a 50s uh, panel truck, a Dodge panel truck, I think it was. Dodge or Chevy or something. And uh, he was broken down. He torn, torn the rear end out of his thing on a rock, big rock, tore, tore, tore his, tore his uh, rear end just right out. <laughs> and uh, Little Hawk was with him, and Little Hawk jumped on my running board and guided me in. And there's Happy Jack at the gate with beer in one hand, open the gate with the other. Oh, welcome home. We love you. Happy day. And, uh, you know, people like Jack were, to me, the real rainbow folks. That, uh, I have to wonder about the ones who
kind of climbed the hierarchy and you know high holies and stuff. Jack was a low holy. Um, he was an embroiderer, and uh, he had a good wife who got a decent job, which helped. Um, because he couldn't, you know, he 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 liked to say that he was uh, he he was on the losing side in the war on poverty. Um, but he was a kind man, a gentle man, a generous man. And one of the reasons, you know, he 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 and many others like him. And I I really need to be thinking about this more. I I do think about it, and uh, but I'm not how you say consistent in living up to what. Desiderata tells us to do. It says, go placidly amid the noise and haste, and remember what peace there may be in silence. As far as possible, without surrender, be on good terms with all persons. So now, I have people that are viciously attacking me. How do I, how do you deal with somebody who's viciously attacking you? Well, I'll speak your truth quietly and clearly and listen to others, even to the dull and the ignorant, they too have their story. Avoid loud and aggressive persons, they are vexatious to the spirit. If you can consider, if you compare yourself with others, you may become vain or bitter, for always there will be greater and lesser persons than yourself. Enjoy your achievements as well as your plans. Keep interested in your own career, however humble, is a real possession in the changing fortunes of time. Exercise caution in your business affairs, for the world is full of trickery. But let this not blind you to what virtue there is. Many persons strive for high ideals, and everywhere life is full of heroism. Be yourself, especially do not feign affection. Neither be cynical about love, for in the face of all aridity and disenchantment, it is as perennial as the grass. Take kindly the counsel of the years gracefully surrendering the things of youth. Nurture strength of spirit to shield you in sudden misfortune. But do not distress yourself with dark imaginings. Many fears are born of fatigue and loneliness. Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You're a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be, and whatever your labors and aspirations and the noise and confusion of life, keep peace in your soul. With all its sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it is still a beautiful world. Be cheerful. Strive to be happy. It's not easy. When... Uh, you know it don't come easy. How, how, how does that song go? I should learn this one. This is an important. This is this is what this is an important, important rock and roll Bible song. Let's let's, let's see what I can give you of this one. One two one two three four. It don't. Nah, I can't do it without without the. You got to pay your dues if you want to sing the blues and you know it don't come easy. You don't have to shout or leap about. You can even play them easy. Open up your heart, let's come together. No, I don't know my mother, but that that that's that and I suppose at this point I've been talking for an hour, right? So now I should play a little, right? That's that's I should probably, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stalled cleaning the kitchen. I'm out of dish soap. But I'm, I'm down to the floors. Um, things are in order, almost. <laughs> My work table's never in order. But anyway, let's turn the camera around. I'll go get some. My dinner's on the table, too. What's the cover for that one? Well, I, I haven't finished my, my breakfast yet. That was dinner and breakfast. I went out last night and bust. 
I'm waiting on a delivery of weed. <laughs> I wonder if she's gonna make it by three o'clock. I really don't want to. I don't want to be late for the start of that show. I will eventually. take apart and clean.
two minutes before I before I, he talked like for two minutes before he filled with his read. Well, you know, as I took it out of the bag, I didn't do anything to read. You know, I took it out of the bag. So the read needs to, you know, <laughs> needs to be filled with at this point. Now that it's wet and working. Now, put my fucking tuna. Shit, that blues it. second half. I got four with three. Sopranos are just like unforgiving across certain intervals. Oh, it ain't even gonna go up that high, is it? <laughs> no, it's not gonna go up high enough. Fuck it. <laughs> I don't have enough sharp on this thing. If I do, I don't know how to play. Um. <laughs>
what do we got going on here? Maybe an hour and a half at this point? Or not quite? An hour and 15. That's good. 12 minutes of music. Back to saying, hey, guys, it must really be, it must suck to be so insecure of yourself as a woman that you have to like totally put me down with your misconceptions about what a woman is, about what a transgender person is, and all that other shit. It must really suck to just be that insecure in yourself as a man or a woman to, you know, insults are not arguments. I'm coming to you and saying that your entire society is corrupted, it's doomed, it's unsustainable. Scientists have been telling you this for years. Um, call me names if you like. That's not going to stop the earth changes that are coming. That's the bottom line. That's why they want to shut me up. Is that I'm one of the life scientists. I'm one of the indigenous life scientists nobody's been paying attention to for all these years. And you want to argue about my indigenity, 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 fuck you. <laughs> I come from a tribal, tribal background. We're indigenous to Western Asia and, and the Southern Europe, Southeastern Europe. And that's, that's my, my heritage, my cultural and genetic heritage is that. And now, my clan, who are uh, ancient Israelite clan, we're Gershomite Kohen, Kohenim, and that's just the way it is. We're the children of Moses and Aaron, and uh, I'm legit. <laughs> I'm real legit. Um, I'm also goofy, and I, I don't know, I have no way of knowing What's imagination and what's being channeled to me? None. Um, but I do get clear answers on true or false and yes or no from the God and goddess spirits. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> you can't, it's not that I'm, I'm like, you know, have, I, I have, I have well-tuned powers of discernment. I get, I get clear answers when I need a yes or no answer or a true false answer, I get a clear answer from my feet or from my heart. Uh, it comes in through my third eye, I suppose. It goes straight to my heart and or it comes up from my feet. If I need a yes or a no answer, that's where it's coming from. And it's accurate. It's more accurate than anything, anybody, any other individual has ever, ever, ever. So don't tell me something that I know to be true is false. Be and, and, and without an argument, you know, <laughs> insults are not an argument. So, um, without, I'm mean, trying not to insult you people because you're just pathetic. Doom nuggets of cosmic food. <laughs> Sorry. Happy day. Thanks for watching. Bye.